Welcome to the stream. I'm Ahmed Shabuddin. Ketamine therapy is quickly gaining popularity and seen as a life-saving option for people suffering from treatment-resistant mental health disorders like depression. But in the U.S., many are raising concerns that increased availability of ketamine is outpacing oversight of the drug, and they say that more research is needed. So today we ask, is ketamine therapy the future of mental health treatment? And of course, we want you to join the conversation as always, so be sure to share your thoughts and questions with us on YouTube. Joining us to discuss all this from Boston, Dr. Robert Meisner, Medical Director of the Ketamine Service at McLean Hospital. In Philadelphia, Dr. Hannah McLean, a physician, psychoanalyst, and founder of Sound Mind Center. And from Los Angeles, journalist Fortessa Latifi, who has documented her own experience with ketamine therapy online, as well as in her writing. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Such a fascinating topic. I want to start, Robert, by kind of asking you, how does ketamine work in this instance? And, and why is it so useful for treating depression? Or is it? Thanks for having me. And, and thank you for your interest in the topic. So we don't know precisely how ketamine works biologically, but we have a, a reasonable working hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And the key concept in that hypothesis is something called synaptogenesis. Synaptogenesis describes the brain's ability to essentially create new or novel connections mm. that may not have been there before. So how does this happen? We think it involves something called an NMDA receptor and the way through which ketamine antagonizes or prevents that receptor from operating as it usually does. Hmm. That then leads to a cascade or a flow of other messaging molecules which communicate with each other that leads to more and more what we call, quote, downstream effects in the cell. You may have heard things about BDNF, for example, a very popular uh, object of study right now, as mm -hmm. well as interleukins in the immune system. There are many second messenger other molecules downstream of this NMDA receptor that ultimately, through glutamate, we think, in part, yeah. lead to synaptogenesis. So I have to say, uh, you know, Robert, uh, coming from a doctor, that was the most uh, layman uh, explanation in a beautiful way. I was still able to follow you. So just for the audience, maybe people who maybe struggled with some of that uh, jargon, I want to share Derek's story. This is someone who has some experience with ketamine therapy, echoing a lot of what you say, but just with different words. Take a listen. My first experience with ketamine, the disassociation that occurs um, between all of your emotional trauma and experiences and your ego, um, separating from yourself. Afterwards, it allowed me to come back to a place where I could kind of view all of my experiences objectively uh, instead of subjectively and, and love all of them and love all the parts of myself. And, you know, from there, uh, there there's still anxiety and, and there's still stress and there's still suffering in my world and in the world in general. Uh, I just have new tools that help me overcome them uh, and, and get back to a place of connectedness and, and self-love and community love. For Tezza, when you hear that, I mean, how does that compare to your personal experience with ketamine therapy? I think it's really interesting because it seems that in ketamine therapy, there are kind of two things that are happening. There's the neurological changes, which the doctor just explained. And then there's also these kind of like mental realizations that you're coming to. And that's secondary, but it's very powerful. Mm. Um, and that's how it was for me. I definitely felt very forgiving when I was doing ketamine. And I felt not only forgiving towards other people, but towards myself and my own um, maybe mistakes that I had made. And it was a sense of peace that was really comforting. And I know I appreciate you using those terms. Uh, I know that other people have used them also from the pre-interview. Uh, I, I loved, Robert, that you talk about uh, ketamine being a great catalyzer for humility and hearing Forteza say that. Mm. And I'm curious, Dr. Hanna, you know, what is this about? Is it about generating empathy? People have described the experience as giving you new perspective, maybe an objective perspective on some subjective traumas. 
what can it be used to treat and, and who should be using it? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And again, thanks for having me. Um, it, it's amazing to be here. And thanks for the interest in this subject, as Robert said. Um, you know, I think it's important. I, so I went through neurology, occupational medicine, um, psychoanalytic training, and uh, I, now I teach therapists and facilitators how to facilitate um, how to become facilitators in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, as well as working with MDMA and psilocybin. Um, and when I teach them, I always say, here's the brain explanation, and here's the other explanation, which is how I want you to think about it. So the brain is really important, and it's important to think about how these um, like synapses and the, the neuroplasticity occurs, but it's also just as important, if not more important in my mind, um, that these substances, whether it's ketamine, psilocybin, MDMA, 5-MeO-DMT, we have so many things coming down the pike. What they do is they help us get into our difficult experiences, get into the difficult memories and really process things that we couldn't process. Mm. Um, and it's like, it seems so simple. And yet it's like, you know, when they say it's like a hundred therapy sessions in one session, Yes, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't. Well, it's, so, um, and, and I can talk about my own experience as well, that I was, I, I, as I was training to be a psychoanalyst, I did four times a week for four years psychoanalysis. Like, so that's, that's how you get trained as you receive and you also have patients. And for me, I had this idea of what my trauma was. I could tell it from like a third party perspective and I, ha I have one of the best psychoanalysts in, in Philadelphia. He's actually 94 years old, and he's trained a lot of the therapists and analysts here. And it's like we could get to it, but we couldn't get into it. And, yeah. and when you couldn't I couldn't connect doing, to it, maybe, or access it, or process it. Right. Or, yeah. Right. There was like, I couldn't, pr and I wanted to, and I was ready, and it wasn't like I wasn't ready. It was just like right. I couldn't get to right. it. And I could, through ketamine assisted psychotherapy and other psychedelic assisted therapies, the legal ones, because you can go to other countries and do legal versions of these things, I was able to actually get into it and feel it and cry and process. And it's like, and then, and then, and then you're, your trauma lifts or your difficulty. And I'm right. like, you know, there's lots of different types and, of difficulty. And, and, and I want to unpack all that. I see Fortesa, it seems like you want to jump in as she was speaking there. Some things maybe echoed with you, resonated. It, yeah, well, so my first two sessions of ketamine, I actually went with my mom. Um, and she came and sat with me because I was very nervous. Uh, I was anxious about how I would feel on the drug. And so she came with me. And we have a great relationship, but it really felt like just in those couple hours, we, it felt like we had gone through therapy for like four years together. Like it just things that I didn't even realize that I wanted to tell her or be able to express were suddenly just like there. Right. And, um, it was really cool. And, and, and I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, we didn't really get to uh, the heart of this question, but who should be considering this therapy? Uh, Robert? So there are a number of different people who can benefit, and there are some folks who we're not quite sure if there's an evidence base or that there shortly will be an evidence base for them to benefit. Right now, the most robust evidence is for folks who, who suffer from treatment-resistant major depressive disorder and possibly major depressive disorder. Mm. There is also quite a bit of evidence for patients who are specifically suffering from suicidal ideation mm. in the context of treatment-resistant major depressive disorder. And I really want to emphasize that one of the reasons why, uh, and by the way, I think of ketamine as the first of, of, mu of much to come, really kind of a gatekeeper to, to things that are coming down the road. Mm. The reason there's so much interest in this medication in part is because we're in a public health crisis. If you look at the first two decades of this century, suicide rates globally, or excuse me, in the United States have gone up in the past approximate two decades by 35%, mm. 35%, right? And we know that the World Health Organization has reiterated depression is the leading cause of, is the leading cause of, um, mm -hmm. let's call it disability morbidity, in the world globally. So we're in a public health crisis and we have drugs that tend not to work very quickly and tend to be permutations of each other. So to have something new that's opening up a gateway for 
other drugs as well. And, as ketamine, and, the psychedelic pipeline is exciting. And Robert, when you talk about it being a catalyzer for humility, uh, I had a personal experience taking another psychedelic. I'll just be transparent. I, I was in a legal environment. It was, um, it was ayahuasca, actually. And it was very hard for me after that experience. I know they're very different. But it's these same um, difficulties in trying to find words to encapsulate this feeling of connecting to traumas, being able to process things. Feeling, you know, feeling very sort of humble about your own struggles, if you will. I mean, that's a very general way of putting it. But I'm curious, before we get into some of the risks and challenges, Robert, why is this humility catalyzer so important? For two reasons. Not a day goes by where my team and I, I think, are not instilled with a sense of respect and humility for this emerging uh, mechanism that that ketamine seems to leverage. And uh, that is to say, we're, we're often surprised uh, about what's coming out and what's evolving as we better understand it. And it tells us just how much we don't know about this very exciting thing. Mm -hmm. I think from a subjective perspective, um, the, a sense of humility one might feel can be due to any number of things, but in some cases probably has something to do with what we heard a little bit earlier before about the combined effects of synaptogenesis in an environment where a patient is allowed to explore new cognitive or psychological stances and starting points mm -hmm. and see things with a new lens. Well, I, I really appreciate you uh, framing it that way because we have a video that we want to share where someone does just that. See, people echoing what you say uh, throughout this show. Uh, doctor, before we get to that video, I just want to share with you, yeah, what, what people are saying in YouTube. For example, Big Red saying, uh, or sorry, Pacifist saying, my wife wants to try it for her migraines. Nothing else has helped, and I'm hoping ketamine treatment will be a miracle. Uh, maybe nothing is a miracle, but, but uh, Merhaba also asking about the side effects. So we'll get to all that. But before we do, this is Dr. Michael Verbora um, from Toronto explaining sort of some of the, uh, the rapid disassociation that can happen. Take a listen. When people are under the influence of ketamine, um, they get this rapid dissociation of, of their, you know, constant thoughts that they normally have. And over the period of an hour, they get a chance to kind of have an opportunity to take fresh new perspectives on, you know, a lot of their personal beliefs or routines or whatever it may be. And for people suffering with mental illness, that can be very therapeutic to have a fresh perspective on, on their life. There's so many people suffering from depression or anxiety who, who want to try ketamine therapy um, or just psychedelic therapy, and they, and they want help, right? They don't want to go do this in their backyard or underground uh, where they don't have a medical team and a therapy team to help them. So Hannah, that fresh perspective that we've heard from time and time again when talking about uh, ketamine therapy, I mean, you've said that the results you've seen have been astounding. And even people who were previously suicidal have felt like you know, their entire traumas or depression has been lifted. Could you just talk us through what's astounding you? Yeah, um, so I, I, like, I, I like to tell people that I, I did 15 years of training in, in Western medicine and I didn't feel like I had any tools to actually heal people, which is, it, it seems ridiculous and crazy, but um, the, the, the healing that we're, that I'm seeing and that my team is seeing in the clinic. And, and I think it's really important to note that we're doing ketamine assisted psychotherapy. It's not like if it's sent to your home or if it's done as an infusion and not together with psychotherapy, it essentially works as a long acting antidepressant. What we're doing is we're really doing therapy. We do four hour sessions. So this, you're seeing one of our patients who was a Marine, um, who had severe trauma, um, saw his best friend die in front of him when they switched mm -hmm. places and he was leading the squad, um, was able to go back and cry and miss and like apologize and um, really feel those feelings of missing his, his best friend he lost. But then he also underneath that was able to uncover all these other traumas and difficult feelings. And what we're working on now in therapy is his grief over his loss of his mother. Um, mm -hmm. And, and just like that, he never got to grieve her. He was in the military. He went home and then had to go back into the field to Iraq, Iraq like two days later. So it's like all these things that get bottled up and you never feel them and you think you're pushing them away and you think you're fine. But actually, you don't realize what you could the life you could be living if you weren't squeezing all these memories back and not processing them. 
And I think a really, um, a really amazing example is someone who came in to us and had treatment resistant depression, treatment resistant mm -hmm. suicidal mm -hmm. ideation for her whole life, yeah. had been adopted. And her first ketamine session, she actually had a memory of being taken away from her mom, saw an umbilical cord and had this her first three years of life were actually, she didn't remember them, but she was remembering being in the orphanage, not really knowing who to turn to, right. and just cried and cried and had no idea it was even part of, she'd been in therapy her whole life, um, had no idea that it was even part of something she should process. Right. Um, and then the suicidal ideation lifted. So I think it's also really important when, in the last clip we watched mm -hmm. someone talk about dissociation, and we've heard that word. and. I think it's really important to know that it's technically categorized as a dissociative, but m most people actually report that they, you know, they'll travel into different realms during their journey, but they actually end up feeling more connected with their body, which it, no one can really explain why that's right. true, but right. it may be part of like you travel and you come back and you're like, whoa, I have a body. Whoa, my body needs rest, you know? So it really isn't um, like, I think we need to, to really just think about that term and, and not just categorize it as just this one thing, but it actually does many things for people therapeutically. M most certainly. And I, I, I see Robert nodding there. Robert, I want to come to you. But before I do, I kind of want to share with our audience. Of course, there's a, another aspect to all of this. There's the startup culture aspect, if you will, a lot of online prescriptions. <laughs> Um, and there's concerns, as we said at the top, about safety, oversight, and accountability. I mean, Robert, if you look at my screen here, uh, this is, I think, one of the wellness centers that are popping up online, you know, discover the power of psychedelic therapy. Here's another one talking about how their program is centered in science and it helps you see transformative results. Uh, yet another one here encouraging you to unlock your ability to heal. And, and you know, I think this is great. It, it, it encourages people to ask questions, to reach out. But, but what are the maybe concerns about the different ways in which this could be abused and the, and the ease with which um, there is access now? Yes, it's, a, it's an extremely important question. So for all the, optimi the cautious optimism and enthusiasm that at the basic science, clinical science and translational uh, clinical re and research levels uh, that there is, many of us are quite concerned that there is at an absence of adequate oversight mm. uh, as ketamine and other molecules and medicines circulate. So my phone rings, you know, several times a month with a disaster story about uh, a situation that evolves somewhere in the country or the world and a patient suffers catastrophic consequences or may possibly death mm. as a result of either yeah. inappropriate procedures lack of oversight, lack of monitoring, inappropriate dosing, mm -hmm. or giving the medicine to someone who has contraindications. Mm -hmm. And it's critical to realize that in translational pharmacotherapy, this field of translational science and clinical science, it's very hard without a strong group of collaborators nationally and internationally mm -hmm. to establish a precise standard of care. Mm -hmm. So one of our goals is to always say, what's the evidence base? Ask, what's the evidence base? Show me the data. And then let's create together a reasonable statement of standard of care that is reflective of the evidence and the data. Mm -hmm. And let's not be fooled or, or coerced into using it outside of those bounds because that's when dangerous, that's when the danger and, uh, mounts and that's when bad things happen. Well, I appreciate that. I also want to share uh, that there are other people in our YouTube chat chiming in in real time saying, for example, Lion Jr., ketamine, a great solution for physical and mental issues but really dangerous when it becomes an addiction. Michael O'Regan yes. uh, saying ketamine is an interesting concept alongside various other psychedelic substances, all very good in theory, but in practice faces resistance from the medical establishment. I'm curious, uh, I see you're, you're nodding, Robert, and uh, Dr. Hannah, you talked about sort of the disconnect between Western medicine and how that inability you felt to actually treat people, but what do you make of this comment, this resistance that we yeah. see? Um, it's, it's or, or Robert first, and then we'll come to you, Dr. Hannah, but I'm curious specifically, you know, we saw this, you know, Oregon, I think in the U.S. context, is now able legally to treat uh, psilocybin, of course, which is magic mushrooms. But with all these psychedelics, we've seen this pushback. Um, what can you share with us, Robert, about that pushback? And is it good? I mean, is, is that going to help us maybe control potential abuse? 
Yes, the pushback is actually, it's not just important, it's critical. The pushback in my experience First, doesn't follow an east-west binary. I would suggest we really deconstruct using that language because it just doesn't follow along those lines anymore. Fair enough. Um, the, the pushback really, I think, is about ensuring that there is an evidence base for the protocols that are being used in the community to make sure that patients are safe. That's pushback that you want to exist, right? We mm -hmm. want data-driven, evidence-based care. And that data-driven evidence-based care uh, is, it can occur, and the research that's needed is happening. What we don't want to have happen is for the unregulated, broader community in which market so, incentives yeah. are extraordinarily powerful right. to dictate care parameters. Un unfor that's money-driving care. No, uh, and I appreciate you saying that. I do want to just uh, take us to another topic because we have this uh, woman who posted about her experience with ketamine therapy on TikTok, uh, Fortesa, I'm gonna come to you after this. Have a look at this. Of course, she's using all those hashtags like ketamine therapy and mental health, but take a look at this. Okay, let's talk about IV ketamine therapy. This treatment is ideal for people with severe anxiety, depression, PTSD, addiction. I have treatment resistant anxiety and depression, which means that I have tried literally every single medication and none have worked. So my doctor recommended TMS and IV ketamine. The benefits are supposed to be long-term or permanent, so I'm really excited to see how they'll stick around long-term. But I have noticed amazing changes since I've started these infusions. I highly recommend this treatment to anyone who has been struggling. It is a game changer and it literally saved my life. Your reaction to that, Fortesa? Yeah, I just wanted to comment really quickly sure. on what you were saying about the companies that are sending it out and kind of making it easier to get. And I do think there's a conversation to be had about the accessibility of mental health treatment, especially in the United States. But as someone who did ketamine in a clinical setting, and I could not imagine doing it outside of a clinical mm. setting and not having a doctor there and not having a technician checking <laughs> my blood pressure. I mean, Seriously, like we talk I about wish, it. I wish, I wish you could like, see the doctors, how heavily they're nodding right now. They're both like, yes, you well, need Well, I mean, <laughs> sometimes I think you, maybe it's uncool of me to say, but sometimes it like hits me really hard and I get very, very anxious. And I literally feel like I am not in a good place yeah. and I need that professional there. And so, sorry, I just wanted to say really quickly that I think it's really important that the accessibility is widening, but... I would never tell someone, even though ketamine has done great mm -hmm. things for my mental health, mm -hmm. I would say if you can't do it in a clinical setting, it might not be the right time to do it. I don't agree with these companies and, and how they're doing. And, and I'm wondering that video, that video that we shared with you, I mean, it also addresses sort of breaking some of the stigma around not just mental health, but, but this whole issue. I mean, how important is that, in, in Dr. Hanna, in terms of moving forward? I know, for example, and I don't want to just mix too many things here, but, but a yeah. lot of moving pieces here. For example, a proposal by Biden in the New York Times here that would ban online prescribing of certain drugs, I would imagine including uh, that ketamine. How important is it that we break the stigma but also keep access available? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's more about, like, how do we keep safety and Keep, keep accessibility in mind, but not throw safety out the window. I don't think sending ketamine home to people is safe in most circumstances. Once in a while, we'll do it. 95% of our patients are all in office. We do like extended in-person um, treatments. But I think it's really important for, for ketamine. There's four categories, really, I see. There's, send, there's home lozenges. There's in-office IV infusions that are usually not with therapy. And then there's therapy... Um, and then you can have like at home, you can have someone sitting with you. So there, there can be alone, someone sitting with you infusion and therapy. Yeah. And I think it's really important that we're keeping these separate. Right. And I also think it's really important to keep in mind that I think the facilitators and well-trained facilitators are really what's going to make or break this ecosystem. Our, um, our program is actually one in seven in the whole country. Okay. That is, um, well, that's using that, that is licensed to train in Oregon. And I think we really just need to keep an eye on who's sitting with who and, and how safety is. And, and we yeah. also need to keep an eye on people like you and other developments of this very fascinating topic, which we will do. I want to thank you in the meantime, Robert, Hannah and Fortesa for being with us. Uh, stay tuned. See you next time.